Thank you for joining me. My guest today is Carl Craver, who is a philosopher of science and of neuroscience at Washington University in St. Louis. His books and articles address questions about the nature of scientific explanations and the relationship between psychological and neural explanations. Welcome. Thanks for coming. It's great to be here. Um, so you're a philosopher of neuroscience. Can you just explain what that means? Yeah, so there are really two different ways of uh, engaging with neuroscience as a philosopher. On the one hand, there are people who hope that traditional questions in philosophy will be answered by findings in contemporary neuroscience. So if one wants to know what the neural underpinning of consciousness is or how consciousness can be implemented in a brain system, they might hope that neuroscience will say something about that. If they wonder how people make free choices, maybe neuroscience will have something useful to say about that kind of, that kind of topic. The other kind of engagement, though, is to realize that neuroscience, like any other science, makes a number of assumptions about its subject matter before it even begins its, um, uh, to dive into understanding how it works. And one role of a philosopher is to, to pull out those assumptions and hold them up for scrutiny um, and to wonder whether or not neuroscience is building on a solid foundation or whether its most cherished assumptions are the kinds of things that might turn out to be false in the long run. But why can't neuroscience or any science do that for itself? Why do we need this other discipline to look in on it? I think scientists can do that for themselves. And I think the best scientists, many of them at Washington University that I've met, are really quite deep thinkers. But there's something about the institutional structure of scientific funding and science itself at the moment that prevents people from thinking in this kind of way. It's very productive for people to find an, a line of research an, an avenue that's worked well for their advisors and has worked well for them for many years, and to continue to push that line using the equipment that they've invested in over time, using the tools that they've invested in over time. And they get so caught up in the race for, for funding uh, and for training graduate students to go out and get jobs that time to sit back and reflect on what it would take to explain the kinds of lofty things that neuroscientists often claim that they will be able to explain, things like consciousness, like understanding, like um, uh, uh, free will, um, uh, to even ask what, what we're trying to explain when we head into those areas and what, what the space of possibilities are for possible mechanistic understanding of those kind of phenomena. So I think that you know, scientists just they often say it's above their pay grade um, to, to address these kinds of topics. Of course, that's meant in a slightly insulting way. But, but the truth is they don't, they don't have time in their schedules to spend hours wondering whether the representational theory of the mind is the correct one. No, they've got a, a, a research program within a broadly representational framework, and they're going to push it uh, until it breaks for them. So. so they revert to certain standards that you're interested in honing in on and saying, hey, did you know you're using this mechanistic uh, uh, worldview or frame of reference? Most people who did philosophy of science through the 1960s and the 1970s started by thinking about physics as, the, as science. And the, uh, the idea that what we think about how physics ought to operate or what an explanation in physics looks like will apply when we get to the biological sciences uh, and especially neuro or the psychological sciences or the social sciences, that there's one thing that we'll, that we'll call science or one thing that we'll call scientific explanation it will hold for all disciplines in science. There was an assumption that that was going to work out nicely, but it turns out that universal laws of brain function are few and far between. In fact, nobody seems to have found any universal laws of brain function in the sense that Newton found universal laws of motion. And so there has to be some other idea of what it is that we're aiming at. When we say that we want a neural explanation for consciousness, what, what are the rules of, of that game? What is, it that we're, what is it that would count as success or failure? And so I was trying to articulate a clear set of statements about what it is that we're trying to accomplish that was more fitting to what happens in the neurosciences or the biological sciences more generally um, than, it, than to, for, for example, physics. So how, how was your work received uh, by the neuroscientific community? It's been you know, a somewhat mixed bag. As I said, there's a, something of a cultural divide between scientists and philosophers. Um, and it, that divide has been in place for a very long time. Um, and, it, it, and especially, I think, in the, 
in the areas surrounding neuroscience and psychology, it wasn't long ago that psychology budded off from philosophy departments. I mean, William James gets credit for being you know, the first American psychologist, was housed in a philosophy department. Um, and, and, and so there's been a gradual sort of peeling off of the things that could be answered empirically from the set of questions that philosophers are really interested in. And then in the 1980s and the 1990s, when I was getting my neuroscientific training, it was clear to me that what, part of what was happening was that psychology departments were beginning to bud off the neuroscientists. And each time there's a budding off, what gets budded off from is treated as, as, some, as a second-class set of questions that can't be answered with the new and glitzy techniques. So the scientific psychology takes off. The more esoteric parts of philosophy, the parts of philosophy that don't make direct contact with empirical questions, what is causation? What does it mean to understand a phenomenon? Um, uh, what does it mean to unify our theories about a given phenomenon. Those kinds of questions, because there's no test that you could go do to, to answer them, were treated as, in a way, um, second-class questions. So I think that, you know, as a matter of sociology, when you have this budding phenomenon, and, and in the cognitive neurosciences there's been an awful lot of budding of that sort, that, that the stuff that gets budded off from is treated as, as in a way, second class. That said, there have been a number of people who've, who've read m my work in particular and have thought that it was a useful way of saying what, what neuroscientists ought to be aiming at. Um, and that's what I really wanted to do, was to provide... It's often said that, that neuroscience is data-rich and theory-poor, um, that we've, we're collecting huge amounts of data, but without any theoretical structure to organize it all. And then the question is, what sort of theoretical structure might we be looking for? Should it look like Newton's three laws? Should there be three statements from which all brain facts follow? Or is there a different way of thinking about what it is that we're looking for when we want to understand how this, how this um, mysterious organ in our head works? So what is the most pressing question in philosophy of neuroscience? Well, the most pressing problem, the philosophy of neuroscience is so young that, that I'm not sure that it's even gelled into a, a discipline of its own properly. There are a few people who've managed to do this. So one, the person who had the biggest influence on me is a person named Patricia Churchland, who wrote a book called Neurophilosophy in the 1980s. And her book was was much more the first kind of project that I was talking about earlier, seeing how findings in contemporary neuroscience could um, transform our understanding of various philosophical debates. And so for her, the, this is the kind of point that she and, and her husband Paul Churchland made repeatedly, that as we study, the, and this is the premises of this argument seem to me undeniable, um, as we study more and more about the brain, it looks less and less um, it, it looks like it less and less like it works the way that we thought minds were supposed to work. There's not a box in there that contains you know, your beliefs about things, and you don't go consult that box and pull out beliefs or, or go to a storage bin of the mind and pull out memory. The brain just doesn't, doesn't work that way, or it doesn't, doesn't seem to work that way. And, um, and the, more, the more sophisticated our neuroscientific theories get, the less there's any direct mapping between what we find is going on between our ears and what we, what we find going on in our minds. So what do we do with that kind of mismatch? If it turns out that the brain doesn't have a system that is responsible for your you know, decision to go to the store today or your preference for baseball yeah. over football or um, uh, your ability to make inferences about things, if the brain systems don't, map on to the way that we in our ordinary lives talk about one another. Does that mean that the ordinary way that we talk about one another is simply false? That we don't have beliefs and desires, that we don't move about in the world for reasons, that we don't draw inferences, that we're really just sort of, um, that the proper way to understand human behavior is in terms of the vocabulary that the neuroscientists are discovering? Or is it rather that we have two entirely different um, ways of talking about people one of which is biologically grounded, and the other one is um, uh, uh, grounded in our practical getting on with one another, and that there's no reason to expect for the legitimacy of that everyday way of talking about one another that it should correspond to the way that brains actually do things. <laughs>
Um, now, the Churchland said, so much the worse for that everyday way of understanding ourselves. If, if it turns out that it doesn't fit with the way that brains work, so much the worse for it. But other people have tried to make the point, and I think it's a reasonable point, that there, it's not entirely clear that these two stories have to, to line up with one another any more than a story about how you can buy things with money should fit together with a story about the molecular components of dollar bills.